understand the future enterprise, how it looks like. And uh, then we'll go through a little bit technical details on the USA's architecture and a couple of very important technical um, points for that. And uh, we also will go in through the features for Lithium release. So when you download the uh, Lithium's release of Open Daylight, what kind of feature you could get from the Unified Secure Channel. And then after that, we'll go through uh, the IoT and the real um, use cases in the industry, leveraging the SD and the USC. And then we open in for questions. So let's begin for that. So why unified secure channel is required by the SD and NFE controller? So if we look at the future enterprise network, the enterprise the office is more geographically distributed. The branch office were located to all continentals. And with the mobile working force demanding storage, computing, networking at anywhere and any time. With the adoption of the IoT, the we expect the networking activities were kind of explosive. So how all those kind of communication between the controller and those kind of network, where kind of network the device and the sensors, um, they are running on top of various protocols on, di on different specification related to security, encryption, and authentications. So the challenges are, first of all, the security. As you know, when the communication between controller and the device cross insecure network, how we could make sure the communication between the controller and the de device is secure? And secondly, uh, some of those protocols, they don't even have a solid authentication defined in their specification. The secondly, <laughs> with the ICT convergence, there's so many uh, protocols between the controller and the device, even with the same controller and the device, it might have the, the different uh, protocols that run at the same time. So in that kind of case, they need to create one channel between the controller and with the same device. And also, they need to do repetitious authentications, which is insufficient. And uh, thirdly, with so many protocols and also activity over, over there, how we could make sure um, for the high velocity and also support the high capacity. So the unified secure channel provides the high security, high performance, and also um, the uh, scalability for this. So the first of all, it encrypt all those encrypt all those kind of communications. Even though you have the security defined or not defined, even for the future, you don't even have it. But by you leverage this, you automatically get this kind of feature. And second is the better performance because all the, the tunnel between the same controller and the device will be reused. So it's much, much more efficient. And also, it's only authenticated once instead of many times. And the third day, we, the U, uh, USA significantly improved the clustering capability, especially at the southbound right now. The open daylight don't even have that. Later, I'll give you more detailed description how we achieved that. So, yeah, I already talked about how we achieved that. So I'll go, go through a little bit of the high-level architectures of the Unified Secure Channel. Um, unified Secure Channel is clear divided into five components, the UI, the API manager, and the plugin, and also agent. Um, by leverage, Open Daylight is a modules um, design. For example, the MDSAR, Young Tools, uh, plugin modules, and uh, other features over there. So the, the, the UI, the UI is inherited with the deluxe modularity, which is a lithium release. So it will display open uh, unified secure channels environment and all other things is going on on that. 
and also the API layer. The API layer will, will tell, um, will be used by third party applications. Then you could see the features and everything what's going on on the unified secure channel. And other three components is very, very important. Oh, sorry. So the manager, the manager is a core component of the unified secure channel. It is responsible for the security management. So you know that's the core part of the unified secure channel. Right now, we, uh, for the Helium release, we only implement for the um, certificate. But in the future, we plan to integrate with AAA and also other uh, authenticate method. Right now, we provide this API. So when you use it in your product, you could leverage that API by using any other authentications you want to use. And the second is the cluster management. So as I talk about, unified secure channel improved the clustering capabilities over there. So the, the main task is implement into the, in the manager component and also configuration management and also monitoring capability, which will expose the API to outside. So uh, the fourth component is a plugin. The plugin has a protocol um, handler. This one is very important if you look at this one. Um, our plugins in the future, like the plugins, all the SourceBound plugin, they could go through the unified secure channel. It's really implemented like the unified. Instead of between the controller and the device and also other things, many, many tunnels over there. Um, for the Lithium release, we already integrate with the NetConf, and right now at the Berlin release, we are working with the Capo app, and hopefully we have more plugin could leverage um, US's secu high security, high performance, and high scalability. Not me, right? <laughs> Um, and also for the plugins, uh, the one we have the Maxer Demaxer. Later, I'll explain to you why we need that. And also TS, TLS, and DTLS to handle the HD, the TCP and the UTP protocol. And we also have the session management because we need to handle multi sessions for the unified secure channel. And the call home listener, which was responsible to keep two connections. One is a call home connection. One is outbound connections with the um, agent. So the agent, agent will sit in the device side. Also, it could be at the IoT's um, gateway over there. They communicate with, with the plugin. It also provides a proxy, a protocol proxy. So in that one, the proxy is at the back. You could say, you could get the regular NetConf server, SMP server, couple app server, or other servers as well. And also, this one could sit in the IoT sensor. So at the back, you could get a lot of, lot of um, uh, the sensors over there to communicate by sharing the same tunneling by that. And then Maxer Demaxer will correspond to the Maxer Demaxer in the, uh, the plugin component. And the core home uh, client is also corresponding to the listener and also TLS details responsible uh, for the security. Um, the US agent piece is not really uh, required because we designed it in the way in case some of the vendors you already have your device that you don't want to install this agent in, into your device, then it still work, you can leverage its security by that. Uh, one thing I would like to point out is the clustering enhancement. Uh, if you look at this picture, we have load one, we have load two. So the load two is directly connected with a device, in, in, like in this kind of picture, but load one is not connected to there. Without the unified secure tunnel, and uh, right now in the ODL, the load one cannot talk to, to this kind of device. But if you look at here, how we improved by that is, for example, the application Send a, send a uh, configuration uh, request to, to the load one because it's only a load, no load one. So the MD sub will route that one into the USA plugin. The USA plugin will first draw just like a regular one to try 
to connect to, to, to the device, but it cannot, if I can, don't find it. And then it go back and then do the remote call to the classroom manager. They are at the same one. At the, um, at the um, classroom manager, it has the information which device is connected with who. And then it finds the correct, correct um, controller and forward the request to that and then reuse this um, tunnel pre-existed. Another very important technical aspect is like we, we talk about the tunnel could be reused. And also the, uh, the multiplexer capability, which means couple protocol could share the same tunnel. Right now, I know lots of people, you are like network engineers, you know it's each one, you create a connection, you can only use one. But this is how the magic is relied on the USA header. So the USA header it provide a very thin layer. It's only eight bytes of the sense, and then provide all those kind of capability. This one probably a little bit abstract. I can just give you an example. If you look at the netconf example, so with the netconf plugin is right now the, the netconf plugin we didn't change. And the talk with before talk with USA. Um, um, plugin, it is there, the message is let come for standard message. And then USA plugin will add that USA headers, a very thin layer over there, basically just like a wrapper. You know, over there, you could see over, over there. Um, and then go through this tunnel, and then USA agent will remove that header, and then we go to the NetConf uh, server, it's just kind of standard one. This one will be applied to other uh, protocol as well, which like don't have security and also other things as well. Um, so that's it's a kind of like a very, very high level of the features, of the architectures, uh, how, how you implement it. And right now I also wanted to um, give a very brief on the features for the Unified Secure Channel in the Lithium release. So in the, in the Lisa release, when you download that one, you could get the following four uh, features. First one is the protocol ma uh, multiplexing, and the third one is the mutual authentication, and third one is the call home, and also the cluster enhanced clustering uh, capabilities. So I could go through very quickly. So for the protocol multiplexing, so if you look at the first one without unified secure tunneling, uh, the, the, the you, you can see the flow between the controller and the device. For each protocol, it has its own tunnel. And with the authentication, they basically do the repetitious authentications for each connection. With the unified secure tunnel, so all the things could share the same tunnel with one handshake, what, which is much, much more uh, efficient than the first one. The second one is the mutual authentication. Uh, some of both protocols, they don't have the mutual authentication, but in a real scenario, across the insecure uh, public network, and it's like the one case, they're a rogue controller, and also there's a rogue device. I know people in this kind of room, probably when you connect to the uh, AC with your device, you never think about, you want to authenticate that side. But I heard there probably has a rogue AC that will steal your information in some kind of way. But in, so, so th that one to you may be not significant, but in the industry, as the enterprise, the security is very important. You don't want your some kind of edge router kind of sense be controlled by some kind of rogue controller. So the, the mutual, the, so the mutual authentication is very, very important in this kind of case. Um, USA leverage TLS is mutual authentication, so provide the authentication for both sides. The another one is a call home. Um, when the device is set behind the LAT or firewall, uh, sometimes the controller cannot access the device. And also some of the device or sense inside the your firewall, they don't even have uh, IPs for that for controller to communicate directly. So the communication has to be initiated by the device to call out to the controller to say, hey, I'm, I want to connect with you. And so that is a call home. If some kind of like other protocol, even though they don't have a call home, 
defined by leverage unified USC, you could get this feature. Um, the enhanced clustering, earlier I already talked a little bit. So for example, in the first one, the controller um, and the controller one and the controller two. The only controller two connected with the kind of device is if without unified control uh, uh, USC, they need to either they cannot access that or they have to create another connections even though the connection exists. So with the USC, it will control one need knows how to forward that request to the one has a connection with that kind of device. So which is much more um, much more efficient. Uh, so I talk about the USC, which will provide the high security, high performance, and the high scalability uh, in the large, wired, like a real-time environment. So I'll hand this <laughs> to, to Jean. He will continue talking about the IoT and how USC and SDN could be used in the real industry case. Thank you, Helen. So before I talk, actually a lot of people were wondering why uh, does uh, STN play in the key role here for IoT? I think a lot of people might have heard about IoT in, in recent years. So I think just uh, write with me, and this is a very quick shot to see, basically give a quick explanation how the STN play in the role in the IoT, how we are expecting the different, different kind of use case to be benefited from this architecture. So a lot of people have already heard of IoT. And we think IoT is not simple, three words, because it represents the next generation of the revolution. 30 and 40 years ago, Silicon Valley started from embedded elect uh, electronics. So then from the internet boom to the, to the data communications. This year, 20, uh, 2015, we think is the year of the IoT, because the, there's already four billion of devices being connected to the, uh, from an IoT aspect, be connected to the world. Beyond that one, there's all, a lot of com companies start to explore in, and deploy those IoT solutions into the real world. And by 2020, there's an estimate about 20 billion to one to trillion dollars uh, to trillion numbers of devices be connected into the IoT world. And that will generate trillions of dollars of business impact. What we think is basically is like Big Bang. From the from, from this year to 2020, so more than five years down the road, it's a big explosion of the devices being connected to the world. With that say, we think IoT for now is basically a rapid disruptive marketing force. It's beyond, it's just not gradually change the world, it's very disruptive. From four, from five of the following aspects we are talking about here. The first one we think is a rapid growth. For now to, 20, uh, to 2020, it's not only the number of devices be widely deployed from the, uh, from the technology acceleration, we all think that it also has short time to pick for the IoT and the IoT-related solution. From Uber, that's one case. People are talking about just one year, two years. This already got big impact. Similarly, for the IoT, it will have a similar kind of uh, short time to pick as well. Another way we think about uh, the driving force for the IoT is, is verticalization of the solutions. There's a lot kind of uh, company-wise try to build a platform to benefit the whole solutions for the IoT. And same wise, we think IoT, in order to materialize its values, it goes to the vertical of the market to, jet, to basically have the impact, direct impact to the industry, to daily people's life. For, for in order to go into that direction, the verticalization will be very important for the IoT. And certainly, IoT will be more, is a little bit complicated by those uh, vertical solutions, benefit use case, as well as those time to mature in this kind of uh, uh, directions. Due to those, those kind of vertical solutions going on, the, in, the, in, the, in the IoT industry-wise, there are also different architectures is evolving right now, from distributed architecture to centralized architecture to cloud-based and also some kind of hybrid architectures. So today, we're not going through driving each of the detailed architectures, but those are different architectures are indeed going on right now. Uh, we cannot claim which one is more uh, kind of prevail than the others, but each one has fit for its own vertical market by its purpose. Another key aspect for the IoT is a heterogeneous uh, landscape. It's not more than, it's different from a service provider market, it's different from the uh, 
current uh, major focus for the SDN on the, on the center side. IoT is, there's a lot of players into these areas, from chief vendors, from makers, to provide those kind of device. Also from server provider, cloud provider, provide the operation and service to, to generate the market into the, for the customers or from enterprise customers. This quite diversified markets as well. In, at the end, we do expect that IoT will, is a combination of IT and OT, basically information technology and operating technology, to provide the best values to impact customers, to provide better benefit for the customers. Go back to a little bit of looking into the IoT market. It is for now, it's a new level of the key market in these areas, uh, like transportation, energy, smart buildings, smart cities, and industrials. So what will happen to IoT being generalized into these all the vertical markets? Those are the changes we think will be down the road, will be, will be there. First one uh, will be the multiplied the complexity bridging the digital world and the physical world. So most people working on IT is focused on the information technology by data communications, but in the IoT, it's just beyond the reach of digital world. It also may change the thermostats for your home, may change the industrial arm for the manufacturer, also may impact the driver direction for your automatic car. So this business is much more complex in the world than what we can imagine for now. And also there's massive connections, it's not just one trillion or 30, 20 billion of device being connected. It is beyond whatever the current imagination we can handle in the current uh, typical world. And certainly heterogeneous connection integration. It's not just one vendor will dominate in one of the area or one uh, vendor will dominate the whole IoT area. It is in cover a lot of industrial areas from vertically and also horizontally. Super dynamics means the device will join and move as well as uh, uh, its migration by the, by, the, by, the, by the space domain as well. Another key aspect for the IoT we want, because for now it's a very early stage, people want to do the IoT, want to make sure the architecture of the system will meet for the future expansion from the architecture wise, from technology wise, also for the future operation of the business side as well. Because uh, yeah, you cannot expect the, the people who buy it, who use it, from customer, from enterprise, will incur a lot kind of OPEX for the cases of IoT. And information context is also very important here, because for the, for the temperature wise, for example, if you want to put the temperature in the freezer, what's the temperature in the room will be dramatic difference in the context wise. Because you can put cold, very cold in the freezer, you cannot too much, put too much cold in the room temperature. So that's, that's for, t for the temperature wise, for, for sensor wise, it's the same, just a, num uh, just a number, but for the IoT, it has total different meanings. And be, be, then we drop down further to see how uh, people are building those kind of vertical solutions. I just gave two, quick two examples, one for the AMI, advanced metering infrastructure, another one for smart car. Then we let's focus on how can people build the AMI solution. In a typical case, we will have the meter, smart meter, parked with a gateway device through kind of well-defined protocols. And on top of that one, that certain applications like billing, access, planning, all the alarms will come along as applications for the, those AMI solutions. That sounds very really simple, but those, let's go down a little bit deep further. In the meter wise, one meter, we have vendor ABC from here provide different kinds of meter for different kinds of reasons. So, and for vendor A, they might use PLC, Wi-Fi, and from another different parts. And then vendor B may provide Zigbee or PLC, and then vendor C provide other kind of protocols like uh, ZV or Lura. And then the communication back to the gateway, they have to be compatible in certain kind of protocols in the link layer, as well as those kind of uh, up layer protocols like MQTT core app. So those are the, all the protocol involved in over here. So by combining all those components, protocols, and applications layers, this system solution wise, I would say is pretty complex. And this is more like uh, 200 years, 30, uh, 300 years ago, when people are cooking the meal. That's why I put a picture here, like cooking the dish. And uh, for now, you just go to the supermarket, grab the, grab the ingredients, and uh, put on the, uh, cook it, and put it on the table. That sounds very simple, but 200, 300 years ago, it's more like if you want to cook this meal, this solution, you have to grab everything, 
more likely by yourself. So in that case, that's what I said, the complexity of the SDN actually demands, uh, sorry, the complexity of IoT actually demands for the, for the SDN. That provides the necessary market, the necessary components, service, for able to build the IoT solutions. That's where uh, SDN come into picture as well. And certainly also SDN will come here to help provide the comp uh, compatibility and integration for IoT and provide the quick service deployment and the possible data aggregation and the analysis. So based on this logic, in Huawei we propo propose this open IoT system called OIS. This on the left is a typical uh, simplified IoT stack, including device, network gear, edge device toward, uh, for the network, for the data integration. I, on top of one stack, we will have IoT cloud service, data analytics, and machine learning services. Then build up from that kind of services, company can build, by, can build those kind of vertical solutions. Based on this basic uh, IoT stack, we have those uh, SDN controller plus IoT uh, uh, products to form this OIC. SDN controller, basically for here, we just simplify the key function base provide the IoT network and application management. On the device side, on the IoT gateway-wise, it has the basic link layer service, plus that one we have this uh, open system. It's based on a uh, common OS distribution. Based on this open system, why people can, we provide a very basic IoT service and can extend that service further by third parties. We do expect this company-wise, other company-wise, also build the IoT solutions around this IoT gateway. And at the same time, the SDN controller will provide the APIs for third-party integrations and the service enhancements. In the O, in general, we think the system will achieve the future expansion and the support for future uh, service expansion through its openness. Yeah, okay. Uh, for uh, the typical service, for example, if you need the data communication, that will be provided in the, uh, the, in the gateway, like an MQTT service and also basically simplified data aggregation and also possible data analytics capability all, all will be deployed in the gateway as well. So let's go back to looking further what kind of value can be provided from SDN contribute back to the IoT architectures. But and in this case, we also emphasize here from the from SDN controller is basically communicate using the uh, USC, the channel, uh, USC channel, just the uh, Helen mentioned about. Actually, I'm a graduate from USC, but I also become a USC alumni now <laughs> for this USC project. <laughs> so the key values we list here is virtualize the resource from IoT gateway for better resource scheduling when you try to enable more IoT services in the gateway. So the virtualization is the first part we think will benefit from the SDN uh, directions as well. The second one we, we think in the, on the future wise, also in, there's two types of access control here. The first one is from device, from the, from the IoT, from the thing, or to plug it into the IoT gateway. That uh, need to be has certain controls uh, to, uh, to make sure the device will be, also, will be plugged in to form the right solutions. And another one is more like from service, pro, from service wide, also plug it into the gateway to op operate on this gateway, for, uh, operate on gateway service and also sensors and aggregators. So in this case, we think I SDN will provide the basic uh, onboarding service and access control and policies of simplified network management as well. And in the future, when the service expansion wise, we also, uh, actually we are already provide the VM based and also con uh, container based isolations for the third party uh, IoT service in the gateway. By leveraging further for the traditional ISDN network functionality, like, 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 like a traffic control, they also provide the reliable data collections for certain IoT required data. Some kind of IoT service require maybe two milliseconds latency 
some can tolerate for a longer uh, uh, like uh, 100 milliseconds latency. So this quite depends on the specific IoT service. But that that's can be managed by those STN controllers to make sure the traffic is kind of collect, the data is collected based on this kind of requirements. And uh, not to go back to the upper layers for the controller wise, you can manage the dynamic service deployment for the service, for the IoT service creation and deploy into those IoT gateways. And once, especially when there's a large amount of IoT, those uh, gateways or, or IoT devices have been deployed, the gateway, the SDN controller will, will provide local connectivity management, protocol access control, firmware, uh, firmware update, as well as life cycles for whole IoT services. Because in the typical case for the IoT, the service may not necessarily just stay in, uh, up there. Certain services will be deployed back into this gateway for the, for the local access and the, uh, and the performance and controls as well. A question? Yeah, go back to the question was uh, basically to ask whether there's a SDN, uh, there's no lossbound API on top of a, a SDN controller. So that first one, I think there is a lossbound API, which just show here as an open API. For the, for, for, for the product-wise, basically, we want to emphasize the openness. But for the function-wise, it is lossbound API. That will interface with uh, other kind of a cloud service to provide data analytics into the data center. That's, that's one case. Or you want to deploy certain service back into the gateway. That's also through the exchange of the, the, the data as using this uh, uh, API as well. Uh, that depends on the application. For typical word, for the IO, for, for the for the SDN concept wise, the drive of configuration actually will be uh, dominated uh, will be dominated or controlled by the SDN controller. Application for these areas wise, we do not expect application per se. For example, if you want a certain kind of uh, you want to open the gate through your con uh, open the light switch or, or open certain kind of a door for your home, you do not necessarily need to configure uh, the 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 switch or the gateway device or the thin directly from the application. This, I, those are already local configurations can be done through either the controller down to the gateways. So application more focused on the business side, focused on application is what is supposed to be sent, uh, concerned. Yeah. Thanks for the question. So back to the, uh, this, based on this architecture, Huawei, we basically have also get this, deploy this architecture for those different type of use cases. So, I just want to show we kind of time. So the first one was called AMI. It's basically advanced metering infrastructure. It is different from the uh, AMR, uh, uh, automatic metering uh, reading. AMR we basically has a limited expansion based on the IoT framework. And how we get into the IoT vertical market first from AMI. And in that kind of solution wise, we in, embedded those uh, IoT principle arch and architecture into these AMI solutions. From here, we can see there's a lot of, kind of meters here, and the aggregating data back to the DCP is basically kind of like ad edge, de edge device, and communicate back to the controller using the USC, and then provide the basic service back to the, uh, to, the, to the typical application layer for the energy distribution management or other kind of uh, uh, um, applications in the AMI solutions. The next solution we call BEMS, more like a building energy 
building an energy management system. BMS is another vertical market Huawei is getting in with using this IoT architecture for the purpose of agile service deployment and for the flexible service control. For now, this service solution covers from one single building to a whole uh, campus. And in this solution wise, so we have a lot kind of light switch, meters, sensors, and uh, also the communication parts back to the gateway. And the gateway can be communicating back to the, uh, to the traditional enterprise edge. And this edge will be, uh, will be controlled by the certain SDN controller in the cloud or in the, in the city in the corporate headquarters. And this provides further service on top of that one for the, for the, for the different type of service control in the either, either CMVS, sorry, CPEMS, and all other type of applications. Go ahead. So let me repeat the question. So for the for the for the for the both cases from he, from the AMI to BMS, is the US agent be shown on to, on both of the cases in the router on the edge? So yes, actually the US agent will be running directly in on those edge device, or in this case it will be the router here. So, so what actually happens? Is it from the Yes, at least, the, at least first it has to be on here. This will form the direct communication between controller and the edge devices, or we call deep gauge device. But this form, this whole part you can treat as, the, treat as a campus. It's not just one, one building, yes. <laughs> this will not. This will be traditional. Uh, solutions or vertical or kind of a, a traditional device with its own with certain kind of modification for its own uh, vertical industry domains. So not necessarily has running those uh, SMP or kind of special network IP protocol. Thank you. Go ahead. Oh. Sorry, I should. Uh, we thought we have another presentation. I actually talk about what is IOTM. It's the IOT, uh, IOT manager or man IOT management. Basically, it's a, a big uh, components sitting the most of the uh, controllers and also, uh, also IOT device. Basically, provide IOT basic device control, data aggregations, or those IOT specific services. Yeah, you, you could treat as a big module of components, yes, in the controllers. This controller is, uh, is compatible with ODL. In this controller-wise, there's a big component uh, for, this, uh, for this IoT DM. I think uh, I can better answer your question uh, for the, about the IOTM in our booth. We have a slide to basically show the detailed diagram about what is basically expand the architecture for the controllers. So this is close to it is, it is, yes, it's compatible with ODL. It is, yeah. But this IOT IOTM, it is an extension for the for the for the for the ODL for the controllers as well. It's ready for the IOT, uh, so it's kind of vertical solutions. The other solutions uh, kind of uh, use case we'll talk about is a uh, ubiquitous IoT. So we talk, we we'll see here the IoT, the IoT gateway is more than just uh, provide connectivity. You could deploy the service on top of that IoT gateway. So that means it has certain network capability, compute and storage capabilities. So by means by extend further, we want to leverage those capabilities in the IoT gateway to increase to integrate more service for the purpose of business operations. For business operations, they are not just based on one type of service. They actually integrate multiple services together for the general solutions, for BMS, CRM, or type of other things. In this case, it's more like a, a gymnastic management system. They do require a BMS to control the, the building structures, 
And they also have a CRM to control for the billing services for customers as well, for sales. And also pushing certain kind of uh, information back to the display board as well. And in this solution wise, IoT gateway and the controllers are basically enablers for the IoT service and applications from deployment, from basic service being deployed in the right solutions to the resource planning and also running environment in the gateway and other systems as well. And then in summary, in summary, we just want to say the SDN and IoT are still rapidly evolving. SDN in general here, they provide a new, dial, a new paradigm for network provisioning and the operation, especially benefit the IoT. And the USC as a whole provides secure and high performance and scalable communication between IoT the gateway and also control, uh, sorry, IoT device, what we mean, get, uh, gateway and edge to the controllers. And Huawei will provide the OIS for the future IoT extensions. And certainly we, we hope, we want also the OIS provide the best customer values in those vertical uh, IoT market. It's not just a, a purpose of, for the platform, the platform on getting into the vertical market to make sure it demonstrates its own values for the IoT. So after one, we have three demos in our booth, and uh, any, yeah, we can invite Helen to come here for any questions or comments. Yeah, actually, I wanted to uh, um, recap one of the gentleman's questions on the US. Uh, yeah. Could you please tell? OK. <laughs> I'm sorry. So I just wanted to recapture um, one of the gentleman's question related, like uh, in earlier, the our solutions, the IoT solutions has a controller and also has a um, USC tunnel and also this side has um, IoT uh, gateway. So the controller right now over here, Huawei has a product called the Agile controller. It's the open daylight compatible um, Huawei's controller over there. So it has a lot of um, open daylight component over there. And then we enhance the S3P and also add a lot of manageability functions inside. Right now, if you look at the open daylight functionality, it has a lot of control capability, but the management side is related to weak. So we add that piece over there. And then we have the agent at the uh, IoT um, gateway side, but not uh, as the USC is designed in the backward compatible. Without that agent, it also work, could get other security, some other features there. But with the agent, of course, you could get the whole, all the benefits of the USC. So I hope to. And the price. Yeah. That's actually a question back to the orange. The first, uh, yeah. uh, the first uh, beginning slides uh, I think Helen talked about, the, the, the purpose for the USC is a combination of multiple uh, possible communication channels through the, a certain uh, dedicated channel. So you could give also an example, like uh, what kind of uh, encrypted channel. For example, we also look at IPsec, and we. Oh, that's, that's, so that's just another commercial 
Right, some SSSH, we, we, also, we also actually, that's a very good point. We spend quite some kind of effort to evaluate like the way you are talking about, like IPsec and SSH, because right now our goal is in this open source, build a unified channel. For example, the limitation of SSH, it cannot handle UDP well. So when we want to unify all those things, we want to handle both TCP and UDP. And then if you look at the solution of the IPsec, the IPsec, like, uh, um, it, a lot of time it requires, uh, like, the business class, the communication. You could get the, um, what's that word? SLA with, from the service provider to say, I need to pay for that to guarantee that kind of connection and all those kind of things. With this kind of solution, with the TLS DTS, it's a very, uh, like, uh, very mature technology, and over there, you actually don't need to get all those things. We, we compare the five aspects, how easy to install, how, how friendly to different kind of protocol, UDP, TCP, and also how friendly for the, um, for go through the public uh, internet, and how easy to configuration. Then we choose the TLS and DTLS, and we believe this one is a winner. Of course, I believe there's other way as well. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Such a limit. Yeah. Um, yeah, so the reason for the, yeah, the, for now, the US agent is staying in the gateway in the edge, because that means you are getting into the certain kind of management domain. Before that one, it's maybe just public domain or internet or, or just go through the cloud or go through other kind of communication paths. So for the purpose, that's typically we'll assume that within that domain, there's certain kind of management or security being enforced within the building or by other kind of mechanisms. That's a very good point. For the IoT, typically there's a lot of things, actually being devices being, being deployed in the buildings or anywhere else. So that device, there's a, there's a, there's a very challenging for, uh, kind of a, a way to ensure the secure channel, uh, security communication between the different things back to the gateway. So, but that's kind of very specific to each of the industrial domain. So if you are using model bus, there's different way to do it. Over you, or if you kind of use, use Zigbee, there are other kind of ways to do it as well. So there's no need to reinvent uh, kind of uh, the, the, the views over there in this area. Or, or there's, other kind of, uh, there's a lot of different protocols being enforced over, over in this uh, okay, southbound we call uh, field area network. So those areas, definitely you can add that further for the application level kind of security. But that's, from that aspect, there are also other different ways to do it as well. So that's, that's not, it's quite diversified. And also, I will say, with the industry move in this IoT area, we could see there's more protocols coming down for the link layer as well, for the, for the, for the, from, the from gateway toward the, the, the device as well. So it's hard. That's why it's very rapidly changing areas. On the, agent, on the agent side right now, we actually run on the standard Linux environment. It's right in C. We actually have two versions. One is in C, another one is in Java. Yeah. Because for the Java, when you download that, then you could very easy to test your environment, just like the simulator. Yeah. But in the production environment, you probably want to use our C version. It has a higher performance. So let's uh, go back to the fundamental theme for our IoT gateway. We test it open. Why is it open? Because we also built those, uh, those open operating system on top of that one. That's, uh, it's based on a common uh, OS distribution. And then we th on top of that one, build further to provide the, 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 the existing, to provide enough framework for the purpose of IoT, including those US agent on top of this uh, framework as well. Oh, yeah, that's... <laughs> that's it is free. 
Yeah. Yes, it's inside Open Daylight, uh, April Open Daylight Lithium release. The agent is, uh, itself, uh, that's a little bit, actually, is a little bit, uh, very good question, a little bit tricky as well. So, um, you know, out of the Linux side, a lot of kind of, and also the application runs on the device side. We actually run out of time, but I could very quickly answer your questions. The agent side is a license issue, so we actually did put it in the GitHub, but you have a hook in the open daylight one because the license is not com compatible, but it's, it's open and also it's free. So you could download there. You, from the open daylight uh, USC um, main page, you could find the pointer to get the C version of the agent, but the Java version is at the lithium release of open daylight, it's free. So basically, just uh, want to uh, kind of a uh, different way to uh, to say uh, what Helen just remember mentioned about for the license things. Because software-wise, uh, the the FreeBSD has its own license. Uh, uh, ODL has its own Eclipse license. So those two licenses are not necessarily compatible. So that's the way how basically we deploy the code into the open source community. But the overall, it's free. Yeah. <laughs> and also, you're welcome to give us feedback and also especially as a collaboration. Like what kind of new features you want, and also uh, if you have any expertise in this side, uh, you are really welcome to help. We have the booth at uh, 103, and over there we have questionnaire, and we also have very cool gift, the fish <laughs> eye <laughs> smartphone lens, and uh, go there, and uh, we could have talk a little bit more, and uh, you also could find us on the open uh, daylight community. Thank you. Great. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Lentils. And with the mobile working force demanding storage, computing, networking at anywhere and any time. With the adoption of the IoT, the we expect the networking activities were kind of explosive. So how all those kind of communication between the controller and those kind of network, where kind of network the device and the sensors? Um, they are running on top of various protocols on, di on different specification related to security, encryption, and authentications. So the challenges are, first of all, the security. As you know, when the communication between controller and the device cross insecure network, how we could make sure the communication between the controller and the de device is secure. And secondly, uh, some of those protocols, they don't even have a solid authentication and the future enterprise, how it looks like. And uh, then we'll go through a little bit technical details on the USA's architecture and a couple of very important technical um, points for that. And uh, we also will go through the features for Lithium release. So when you download the uh, Lithium release of Open Daylight, what kind of feature you could get from the Unified Secure Channel. And then after that, we'll go through uh, the IoT and the real um, use cases in the industry, leveraging the SD and the USC. And then we open it for questions. So let's begin for that. So why Unified secure channel is required by the SD and NFE controller. So if we look at the future enterprise network, the enterprise, the office is more geographically distributed. The branch office were located to, to all conditions defined in their specification. The secondly, <laughs> with the ICT convergence, there's so many uh, protocols between the controller and the device. Even with the same controller and the device, it might have the, the different uh, protocols they run at the same time. So in that kind of case, they need to create one channel between the controller and with the same device. And also, they need to do repetitious authentications, which is insufficient. And uh, thirdly, with so many protocols and also activity over, over there, how we could make sure um, for the high velocity and also support the high capacity. So
So the Unified Secure Channel provides a high security, high performance, and also um, the uh, scalability for this. So the first of all, it encrypt all those encrypt all those kind of communications, even though you have the security defined or not defined, even for the future, you don't even have it. But by you leverage this, you automatically get this kind of feature. And the second is the better performance because all the, the tunnel between the same controller and the device will be reused. So it's much, much more efficient. And also it's only authenticated once instead of many times. And the thirdly, we, the U, uh, USC significantly improved the clustering capability, especially at the southbound right now. The open daylight don't even have that. Later I'll give you more detailed description how we achieved that. So yeah, I already talked about how we achieved that. So I'll go, go through a little bit of the high level architectures of the unified secure channel. Um, Unified secure channel is clear divided into five components. The UI, the API manager, and the plugin, and also agent. Um, by leverage, open daylight is the modules um, design. For example, the MDSAR, Young Tools, uh, plugin modules, and uh, other features over there. So the, the the UI, the UI is inherited with the deluxe modularity, which is a lithium release. So it will display open uh, unified secure channels environment and all other senses going on that. And also the API layer. The API layer will, will tell, um, will be used by third party applications. Then you could say the features and everything what's going on on the unified secure channel. And other three components is very, very important. Oh, sorry. So the manager, the manager is a core component of the unified secure channel. It is responsible for the security management. So you know that's the core part of the unified secure channel. Right now, we, uh, for the Helium release, we only implement for the um, certificate. But in the future,